Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a recital of both lute and guitar music for the Cleveland International Classical Guitar Festival. And it's always been a pleasure for me to come here and play in this wonderful festival. And I'm sorry that we're not actually together in person. Um, I don't really quite fit in here because, as you see, I don't play the guitar, but I play the lute. And uh, the lute came in so many different shapes and sizes, a uh, number of strings, different tunings, and basically it got more complicated um, throughout history from around 1500 until actually the last lute player we know was still a, was alive when Schubert was alive. So it had about 300 years, um, 250 years, my math is always bad. Um, the program tonight is just on this one lute, which is an 11 course lute, uh, course being a pair of strings, and it was the type of lute most popular in France for about 100 years, from 1630 onwards, and also in Germany, Bohemia and Austria. And the program begins with two pieces by old Gautier, Vioc Gautier, Enemond was his name, and he was the one who started using this particular type of lute, which has a chord of D minor for the first six, and then a scale down to there. And the highest note is this highest fret here. They never use body frets. And we're going to hear two pieces by him uh, with a little improvised prelude that comes before that, because we don't have any preludes written down by Gautier, uh, but there were many by other composers. Um, he wrote a tombo, literally a tomb, which was um, a piece in memory of somebody, and this was in memory of his teacher, René Maisonjo. Um, so it's called the tombo de Maisonjo, and it's in the form of an allemande, and that's followed by perhaps his most well-known piece, which is Canary, which is a jig, um, type that we can hear in a lot of Bach too. Um, and Gautier died in the 1650s, but these two pieces were printed a bit later. And then we move on to a wonderful composer who's not well known enough, but actually um, the first time I heard a piece by Isaias Reusner was in a record of John Williams from about 1968, um, a Paduana. Um, so I'm going to play a suite of pieces in A minor, Paduana, Alamond, Courant, Saraband and Jig. And it's just wonderful stuff. And uh, Reusner was born in the same uh, Wrocław in Poland, the same city that Weiss was also born in. And it's like he's the link between French music and Weiss's music. And maybe you'll hear a little bit of both styles. And then after that, to two well-known pieces, but well-known for different reasons. One, a fantasy in C minor uh, by Silvius Leopold Weiss. And it's one of few pieces that he actually put a date to, and he often went to Prague. And this one is dated in 1719 in Prague, which was just about the time when he started his court position in Dresden. 
but there was a famous lute maker in Prague and also some rich students. Anyway, this is a, I heard this piece in the 1960s played on the guitar by Julian Bream. It's a wonderful piece. Um, half of it is Im improvised sounding arpeggios leading to a little quasi fugue, wonderful little gem. And I followed that with something quite different, a, a passacai by Heinrich Bieber, who was a famous violin virtuoso. And um, he was well known by many people. And there's a lute arrangement of a violin and continuo passacai from his sonatas for violin and continuo in C minor. And it makes a just wonderful piece, a mixture of rhythmic chordal passages with um, those broken up into arpeggiations. It doesn't use all the notes from the original violin version, um, but it has a deep, somber, melancholy, strong, um, quite a wide range of emotions and uh, brings us back again to the tombo that we started with. So I hope that you will enjoy this recital. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, this is Robert Gruca, and I would like to share some thoughts with you about playing scales and uh, more specifically the right hand in different scenarios in music. So um, we all learn to alternate I and M or, or two finger ones. And although three finger ones have been an outside of the box kind of thing, they're coming into play a little more these days. So um, often within one piece, the Malat's piece you heard, um, I use three different kinds. I use the I am, and let me give you an example. So when the middle part, I use slurred scales there. So, so I use it there to be uh, a contrast to what's coming up. There's, there's what it is, is that section. You have the chords, a run, chord, run, chord, run. And so the first one, that's the first one. So, so I keep it on the mellow side. Slurs are nice, slippery. And then, and then the second one, I use free strokes, but a three finger using the thumb. So it's kind of like a MIP, MIP type thing. So, and I, the reason I like that, we always have to keep in mind the musical exploring all these different fingerings at the same time of thinking the musical end. So sometimes you might be doing a free strokey scale that feels really comfortable, but you needed it bigger there. So it was better to, you know, maybe work on doing another stroke. So the second one, uh, free strokes. The cool thing about the free stroke is I can get a little more edgy. So I'm getting edgier and a little more naily, a little more straight on versus this. So, um, and the free stroke is a nice way to hop back to the chord because we go. Uh, that's it. So the tendency with a lot of us is to, you know, we play a rest stroke. It's, it's easy to, it's a little simpler stroke. So we kind of can lean a little back, you know. Um, on a separate point, it's always good to try to practice your rest and free strokes so you're not moving your hands so much. So so that you can hop in and out of them. But uh, in this scenario, I use the free stroke. Gets me to this chord easier. I'm building a little bit, a little sharper uh, tone. And then we're on the big run. So I save the big run for, here we go. The, those are primarily I and M. And I'm... Then I go into the three finger AIM, AIM thing to get a little whip on the end if all goes well, so, <laughs> so. And then I shift, and then I go into the three finger. And... So the three finger one allows you to divide the work up. So when you can, whenever you can divide the work up, it makes the right hand easier, puts your mind at ease. Although it does take a lot of time to get, get comfortable with it, so I'm still working on my three finger ones. I, but. I guess my message to you is, is um, keep an open mind when you approach a part of a piece to how you attack, you know, um, at least in, the, in this scenario, scales, how you're attacking it. Be open to trying different... That's the fun uh, part about crafting and carving out your interpretation with music is finding how you like to play the scale, matching your... And everybody's different. We all have different affinities to things, you know, some people, real good free stroke or real good rest stroke. Use that to your advantage, but always keep in mind that musical end, you know, make sure. And sometimes that requires us to uh, bear down on something we're not quite as, as up, up to par on. So, so, so with that, thank you so much for watching and happy scales. <laughs>